from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining the today's program. A uh, discussion by three Washington area authors, so-called bonsai trio. <laughs> uh, I'm McLaren, Sandra Moore, and uh, Stefan Boss. And I think everybody has already gotten a book, but I don't see many books on your hand. <laughs> uh, books are for sale even after the lecture, so please get it. If you haven't, no worries. Uh, my name is Mari Nakahara. I'm a curator for the um, architecture, design, and engineering at the library's prints and the photographs division. I also serve as a coordinator for today's program. And this program is one of the 2017 National Cherry Blossom Festival, uh, co-hosted by the library's prints and photographs and Asian divisions. Library has been participating in the National Cherry Blossom Festival from 2012 when uh, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Cherry Blossom Tree Gift from city of Tokyo to Washington, D.C. And I decided to continue hosting events and programs coinciding with the National Cherry Blossom Festival every spring, even if the scale is much smaller. This is my effort to pursue one of the library's goals of providing general understanding of American cultural, intellectual, and social life and of other peoples and nations. I'm also hoping that these events and programs will, in the future, inspire greater interest in Japanese culture, the U.S.-Japan relationship, and also the library's diverse collections in the general public, including K-12 students. We have a saying in Japan, keizoku wa chikara nari, which means that something will blossom if we are persistent. This is another reason that I continue these events and programs. Here you will see on the edel one of my favorite collections related to cherry blossoms, 11 varieties of the cherry blossom trees sent from the city of Tokyo to Washington, D.C. in 1912. These are facsimile copies, but the originals are held at the library's print and photographs division. Today, Stefan Boss is going to donate six photographs of bonsai trees, two of which are shown here. That's why I asked you to move to the left side, as well as a photograph of our new librarian um, of Congress, Dr. Hayden. They will be added to the prints and photographs collection. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Many people may think that Library Congress collections are not open to the public, which is not true. We welcome everybody if they are 16 years or older with a valid reader's card. The library's Young Readers Center is open to, um, open to the public, but much younger generations where our children are able to read books like one by today's speaker, Sandra. <laughs> they host reading programs periodically. I host Japanese Culture Day there every spring as part of the cherry blossom celebrations. What I introduce now is the little bit of the tip of the iceberg of the library's collections and activities. I would strongly recommend you explore the library's collections via our website first and visit the library. Amma Clearan is one of our patrons who uses the Library Congress collection frequently. She will show uh, a few library items in her presentation today. In 2014, she kindly accepted our favor to talk about her cherry blossom book at the library, which is also for sale today. Today, she returns to speak about 53 bonsai trees Japan gave as a bicentennial gift to the United States in 1976, and also moderate the panel discussion. 
Well, I should stop now <laughs> and give the microphone to Anne. Thank you again for joining today, and I hope you enjoy the program and the lecture, and I leave here with a great inspiration. Thank you. Thank you, Mari. <clears throat> it's really a pleasure to be here, uh, a thrill. And as Mari said, um, I have a frequent flyer here at the Library of Congress, and it's wonderful to be back and share what I've learned. What we'll do today is um, I'll give an overview because the book that I wrote, Bonsai and Penjing, Ambassadors of Peace and Beauty, that's this one, is an overview of the collection of bonsai at the National Arboretum. And then uh, Sandra Moore will talk about one of the trees there. And then Stephen Voss will talk about his experience as a photographer of the bonsai. And then I'll wrap it up talking about some of the other collections. And then we'll go to questions and answers. So without further ado, let's get started. And just to start things off, here's an image from the prints and photographs collection, which I dearly love, because this was um, it, it's a woodblock print from 1861, less than 10 years after Commodore Perry opened Japan to trade with the West. And there's an American merchant admiring a cherry blossom tree that's in a, in a bonsai form, a small tree. So it's everything all in one picture that I love. And um, it's a, a foretelling, actually, of the gift from Japan, first of all, of the cherry blossom trees in 1912, and then the uh, bicentennial gift of bonsai in 1976. So before we get any further, what is a bonsai? Um, the, a bonsai, it can be, the, the word bonsai can apply to a small tree in a pot from anywhere in the world. You could have a bonsai from Brazil. The reason that the museum is called the Museum of Bonsai in Penjing is that there are Chinese versions, and the, the original um, examples were from China. It's something that, an art form that the Chinese have been um, pursuing for a thousand years, maybe more. Um, and the word penzai, penjing, bonsai, they all mean tree in a pot. Um, so what happened was that, so what it is is the idea of experiencing a tree small size. If you think about it, in the world, in nature, we're usually smaller than the trees that, that we see. So there's not ever a point where you can ex experience the whole thing at one view. You have to look up and down or left and right or something. But a bonsai, you can get in one, one fell look. Uh, the other thing that, that it does is it, in, it, it, it provides the illusion of old, of ancient. And I chose this example because I think it really shows that. It's a Japanese white pine. And um, it comes from the island of Miyajima. And can't you just see how it's sort of been, it gives the illusion of having been, you know, leaning into the winds off the water, you know, for, for eons, with that thick trunk and the chunky bark. So in my mind, what this is, it's a way of, of expressing, of experiencing, you know, almost uh, once upon a time in the Western uh, idea. So it's a way of, of experiencing what's a time before, and it gives you a bridge to the world that's outside of your daily concerns, that takes you out of your you know, your, the sort of the daily grind, if you will. Uh, we, this tree has been in training since 1879. And what we mean by in training is, at some point, someone, a person, chose that tree, took it either from the wild or from a nursery, set it aside, cut away its tap root, so all that was left are the feeder roots. And from that point on, the tree it needs a person to take care of it for the rest of its life. We'll all be talking about this in our various talks, but it's really one of the, the great treasures about a bonsai because these trees live for hundreds of years, and it means that there's a constant sequence of people who take care of them through that time. When you think about it, this living off its feeder roots is really something because a tree in nature could have tens of feet, hundreds of feet of area of roots. But in, if you look at it, this is reduced to just a small pot, and that's why it's so important for humans to, to pay close attention to the trees that they're caring for when they're a bonsai. The great thing about having the Bonsai Museum at the Arboretum is you can find large versions of the small trees right outside. And here's a Japanese white pine really at the front door of the museum at the Arboretum. You'll walk through a uh, alley of cryptomeria, which is just what you do if you were in Japan visiting a shrine or a temple. And it's, again, another way of leaving the, the, the daily cares and worries of your life outside, in this case you're leaving them on the grounds of the Arboretum, you enter into the museum area, and it gives you a chance to kind of um, reflect and you know, lose yourself in the beauty of the moment. 
The museum is set up in a Japanese style to honor the gift of trees in 1976. Um, so that was a choice they made. The, the entrance, is, as you can see, is a Japanese, well, this is the inner part of the museum. And like any museum, it's set up in rooms and spaces, many of which don't have roofs or ceilings because these are living works of art and they need to have, they need to experience sun, rain, you know, snow to a certain extent. And most of the year, there'll be a tree on display, just as you can see this uh, ginkgo through the, the gate. And that means that there's a tree that um, the, the person in charge, the curator or the bonsai master, feels is particularly noteworthy. So when you go to the museum, which I hope you will, do check out the, the tree that's on view there. So how all this started, uh, as Mari said, was with a gift from uh, Japan in 1976 to honor the bicentennial of the United States. But actually, it started in 1975 when this picture was taken when it shows the uh, Japanese dignitary handing the American ambassador at the time the paperwork that made the gift official. And the reason it was a year in advance is that the trees needed to be in quarantine for a year. And so this was all happening in Tokyo and Japan. The, um, the tree on view is tree number one. And they, the reason it was tree number one, it's a Japanese black pine, but they thought at the time that it had been in training since 1776, which would make it the same age as the United States. They found out later that it's only been in training only since 1895. <laughs> so it's, it, but it's still tree number one, even though it's not as old as the United States. Uh, the, there were 53 trees, and 51 for each state, and then three from the imperial household. When the emperor and his family learned what was afoot, they wanted to be part of it. So there were 50 trees from the government and three trees from the imperial household, and this is one of them. It's a Japanese red pine, and don't you love that zigzag uh, trunk? I think it's really extraordinary. It's one of a pair. The other one is in the imperial household in Japan. Um, it's been in training since 1795. It's huge. Bonsai can be as small as my thumb, or more typically about this big, but they can be also as, this is almost as large as I am, maybe larger. And of course, for the imperial palace, which has big spaces, you'd need bigger trees. But it's still smaller than if you experienced a tree like this, particularly of that age, um, that, uh, in the wild. So here's a funny story about that tree. The Emperor Hirohito and his wife came to the United States in 1975, and the one thing the Emperor wanted to do was visit the tree. And of course, the, uh, an itinerary for an emperor is not going to include enough time to go out to suburban Maryland, which is where the tree was in quarantine. <laughs> so they had to find a way to get the tree to him. And they had to find a way to do it so that it wasn't it going to be around any other plant material. So of course, you know, getting it into a truck is no problem. And you know, getting the truck to the White House was no problem. But then what? Well, somehow they found a, either a back staircase or some private way to get the tree up to the Ford's private residence. And that's where this picture is taken with President and Mrs. Ford meeting with the emperor and the empress with the tree. And I like to think that if the, um, if it was a White House, if it was a Department of Agriculture photographer, their tree would be more prominent. But <laughs> if, anyway, it's, um, it, it's there, it's proof, and we know that it all happened. In 1975, the J Japanese Suiseki Society also gave this beautiful viewing stone and you'll find a collection of viewing stones at the, uh, at the museum. I bring it up just so if you go to the museum, you're not surprised. But I also think they're, they're associated very closely with bonsai because what these are, these are rocks found in nature that, again, take a big, a big idea and show it in a small way. And there's this kind of magical quality, for lack of a better word. In this case, the, the um, crystals in the rock look like chrysanthemums, and the color of the rock make it look like, um, you know, a, a, full, a full moon night in the fall. And uh, so if you think about it, if you were going to have something like, experience something like this in the wild, a garden would be huge, much bigger than a rock this big. And not only that, we're looking at this picture in April, and the, the, you wouldn't see chrysanthemums looming until October. So again, it's a way to, experience, to, to take, out, take yourself out of your daily life, you know, be expanded, have, have a, a, a change, a, a, a transformation, if you will, in your mind and in your heart. So back to Tokyo, the, the, um, the trees were put on view for everyone to say goodbye to before they came to the United States. And here's one of the oldest trees, well, the oldest tree, 
on view, and you can see the Japanese fellow just in awe of how old it was when he realized what it was. This, this took place in Ueno Park, for those of you who are familiar with Tokyo. And everyone knew that this tree was very old, but no one knew its real story until this gentleman turned up at the museum in 2001 and told an amazing story, which Sandy's book talks about in more detail. So hold on, and she'll take over. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Anita. Yes, sir. Good morning. Um, I'm the author of a book for children um, a, that adults can also enjoy, but um, it's primarily a book for young audiences called The Peace Tree from Hiroshima, The Little Bonsai with a Big Story. And um, my connection to the bonsai world really began um, when I took a fall tour of the Arboretum with the curator, then curator Jack Sustick. And I saw how delighted the uh, children were by the koi fish in the reflecting pool and how charmed they were by the small, colorful bonsai trees. This was in the fall. And, you know, as um, Anne was saying, um, you know, what delights us and is, you know, informative to us about seeing a bonsai is that we can see the whole tree, um, which isn't, we can't do in nature. But for children, it's especially um, exciting to be bigger than a tree, you know, <laughs> after all. And most of the bonsai in the Arboretum's collection could fit on a child's school desk. So I had a feeling that there was children's book magic in the air. While I was impressed by the incredible variety of bonsai that masters um, from China and North America had in the Arboretum's collection, I was really smitten by the trees from in the Japanese pavilion. And there were, because there were so many stories, um, fascinating stories connected to each of the trees. Um, the two here are a ginkgo, which you can see um, on the right, and then the trident maple on the left. And they had been planted and sculpted by bonsai masters uh, for well over 100 years. The trident maple on the right was a gift from a member of the royal family and has been in training since 1896. Although the final stop on the tour w w was building up to this was the really the crown jewel and the oldest uh, resident in the arboretum, um, the Yamaki pine. The Yamaki pine is named after the family that donated it. And this magnificent white pine is actually quite large for a bonsai. Uh, with a wide and deeply grooved trunk. The curator was clearly fond of it, um, Jack was, and delighted to share its life story with us. First, he explained that the tree had been in training since 1625. Wow. <laughs> Most Americans, I think, consider them to ha themselves to have a green thumb if they're able to keep a potted plant alive for three years, maybe. But um, the idea of <coughs> keeping a tree alive for 350 years is just unheard of. Um, but the Yamaki family had uh, that distinction. And it occurred to me, oh, let's see, there's the, this is the, um, sorry, the, um, plaque that's underneath the white pine. And um, it is mostly referred to as the Yamaki pine in honor of the family, but it's also sometimes known by its name, uh, the part of the scientific name, Miyajima. Um, it occurred to me that this tree is amazing witness to history. From the days of samurai and castles in Japan to the age of modern cell phones in America. It's seen it all. Yamaki pine was also cared for by one family for uh, five generations. And uh, the illustrator of my book, Kazumi Wilds, you can see here in this illustration, um, did a great job of showing how the caregiving was passed down from father to son from the Edo period um, until uh, 19, in the 1970s. And the family would later provide me with a, ge a genealogical chart. 
um, with, that had all the names of their ancestors. So we could use names like Itaro and Wajiro, who were their ancestors, in our story. Perhaps the most amazing and, and shocking thing um, that I learned that day was that the Yamaki Pine was a Hiroshima survivor. The Yamaki Pine, uh, the bonsai, was on the porch of Masaru Yamaki's house in Hiroshima in 1945 and survived the atomic bombing, though it was only two miles from ground zero. This photo shows Mr. Yamaki being interviewed um, probably by uh, Japanese radio reporters. Um, he was well known as a master bonsai artist and um, of course after the stories that we're talking about um, the impact on families and all the deaths, um, there were also concerns about um, these special trees. This is Mr. Yamaki. And this is uh, when, on the occasion of his uh, visit to the United States. All of the donors of the bonsai were given a free trip to the United States. Unfortunately, he, he had been ill, but by um, 1979, three years after the don donation, he was able to come. And one of the things that moved me about um, the story was how devoted his family was to it, as if um, the tree were really a member of their family. And the curator told us one anecdote that um, I'd like to share that demonstrated the strong connection between the Japanese family and th this beloved tree. Um, when Mr. Yumaki came to visit, the story goes that he came um, in a black limousine and he toured the collection. Um, he was with hosts from the Arboretum. Um, but then he stopped in front of the white pine and his hosts noticed that he had tears in his eyes. And of course, you know, they were worried, you know, is there something we've done wrong? And the translator asked Mr. Yamaki, is everything all right? And um, in, in just a moment's time, he, you know, after pausing, he said, oh, yes, everything's fine. Um, these are tears of joy because I can see that uh, my tree is happy here in its new home. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> um, I shared the story with everyone I knew and it never failed to make an impression and I think that was really the moment when I decided I was determined to turn it into a story for children. First I knew I needed to be in touch with the Yamaki family and um, fortunately I had a friend Chizu who was a reporter at Reuters and um, she uh, and a Japanese native Japanese speaker she helped me translate my letters um, to the Yamakis and you know I, I was asking them may I tell your tree story. In response I received an email from Yasuo Yamaki, uh, actually his son, um, and um, his son wrote me an email and the email said it is a delight that the Yamaki pine attracts public attention. I think my grandfather must rejoice in heaven. So, of course, I put this note on my bulletin board uh, to motivate me as I searched for a publisher that would share my enthusiasm for the tree story. In March of 2014, I received word that it, from an editor in Singapore that Tuttle Publishing would produce my book. I was, of course, delighted. Um, and then the next thing, uh, as a children's book author, you're always really anxious to find out who um, they would choose to illustrate your book. And I felt strongly, and as did Tuttle, that we needed a Japanese illustrator to ensure that the book was culturally sensitive and authentic. I wanted someone who had been to the places uh, that we would be writing about, um, that had sensitivities about the war, um, and that person, um, fortunately for me, turned out to be Kazumi Wilds. Um, Kazumi uh, had actually lived in the States for a short time, but she was living in Japan at the time. And in a stroke of good luck, um, she was just beginning a graduate program um, in the United States, in Iowa, and that meant that she could come to Washington. So she came and stayed with my family, and um, 
uh, her, the first job was to meet the tree, as she said. I need to meet the tree. And um, then she looked at photographs in the Arboretum's archives and toured Washington, all things that she um, needed to do and, and things she needed to sketch so that when she returned home, um, or actually when she returned back to Iowa in this case, um, she could begin the paintings that would become the book's illustrations. This is one of the illustrations from the book as well of um, Masaru uh, Yamaki as he's saying goodbye to um, Miyajima. Um, I wanted the book to be about reconciliation and peace and um, the significance of the Yamaki's gift uh, is that it demonstrates that peace is really built between peoples long after uh, the peace treaties are signed. And uh, answers a question, I wanted it to answer a question I sometimes ask children, which is, how do you make friends with someone after you have been enemies? Um, Mr. Yamaki uh, chose to um, make a peace offering with um, not just uh, one of his very large collection of bonsai trees, but you know what his family said was really his favorite and his and the oldest in his collection. Um, but given the tree's history, we could not skirt the fact that um, America and Japan had been in a bitter war, and somehow, um, you know, I had had to. Um, think about that a lot when I was writing the text and then it became the challenge for Kazumi, uh, the illustrator, how to portray the atomic bombing in a, a book for children. Um, as, as I'm sure you're, you know, many of you are familiar, there are so many images, many of them that would be really disturbing or frightening to a young audience, so we had to be uh, very careful. Um, this from the Library of Congress's archives is um, a photo that I'm sure you're all familiar with of the dome uh, that survived, the Peace Dome. Um, it's now often referred to, and it's part of the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. That actually is shown uh, in a very uh, distance in one of the uh, illustrations of our book. Um, out of the 32 pages in the book, just four are devoted to um, the uh, Hiroshima chapter of the tree's life. And in this di image, which is uh, difficult, but I think um, gentle um, as we could be um, in a book for children, uh, Kazumi shows Hi Hiroshima reduced to rubble, and she chose um, you know, two images in particular that she thought children would resonate with, which is there's a little dog and um, in, the, in the lower part of the illustration um, and a tricycle. Um, it's followed, the next page in the story, um, by a picture that shows Masaru bowing in gratitude because his family and their beloved bonsai were spared. Um, as the reviewer for the Kids Post, uh, the Washington Kids Post said, in her art, Wilds doesn't show the horrible details of the bombing. Instead, she uses darker colors to set a sad, quiet tone, which you can see in this illustration, and brighter colors to reveal hope as the city recovers. This beautiful illustration, probably my favorite from the book, shows post-war Hiroshima and is full of hope and spirit and cosmos flowers. The painting sets the stage for a much happier chapter in the tree's life at the National Arboretum. As the story, as our story comes to a close, Mr. Yamaki arrives at the Arboretum as he did in real life. But in our story, he is accompanied by his grandson. This, we, we were pretty much slavishly um, uh, attached to the true story in um, our book, which is you know about 99% nonfiction. Um, and, but the one uh, way in which we um, change things is that we uh, used, he actually has a grandson 
um, that's named uh, Akira, and that's the name of the character here. Um, and uh, Akira now is in, I think, his, his maybe late 20s. And he also, um, there was a photo in the beginning that Ian showed you of him visiting um, the Arboretum. But um, I wanted to have a young character in the book, so we have Akira coming with his grandfather as a young boy. And as you can see in this final illustration, he's giving his family's tree a loving pat. Our book was published seven decades after um, the bombing of Hiroshima, and I think it has special resonance now because we're at a time when reconciliation and peace between our two countries continues to deepen. This was evident when Barack Obama became the first American president to visit the Hiroshima Peace Memorial. And like the gentleman um, who was embraced by Obama in this photo, uh, the um, uh, Yamaki Pine is a Hiroshima survivor and has contributed in its own small way to the process of re reconciliation and peace. And when I share this book with children, uh, they seem to understand and appreciate the significance of the tree as a peace symbol. And I'd like to turn the podium over to Stephen, who found great peace in photographing <laughs> the bonsai. Good afternoon, everyone. I am thrilled to be here. I want to thank everyone at the Library of Congress and Mari for um, all your help in making this work. Um, so my name is Stephen Voss, and I am a photographer here in DC and make my living mostly shooting portraits of people, um, actually spending a lot of time in this area with a lot of politicians doing that sort of work. And um, I've done this work for a long time. I've um, and you know I've always sort of had a, a personal project on the side, something I did when I wasn't doing my professional work. And a couple years ago, I had just finished this personal project where I had walked the entire border of D.C., the 40 or so miles, sort of meeting people, photographing people, and trying to you know understand my city in a way. And as I had finished that up, I started to think about what what's the next thing I wanted to do. And at the time, I had. Um, had some frustrations with my professional work. Uh, when you shoot portraits of people, you know, you want to make a connection. You want to do something that, um, you know, is get a response out of them, you know, have them reveal something of themselves. And what you find in Washington often is that, uh, you know, people are busy. So often, you know, you, you schedule a time, you, you're going to photograph someone, you think you're going to have 30 minutes. And then in one example, um, and this is the one I, I always come back to, is I had a, an appointment to photograph Mikhail Gorbachev, which I was very excited about, I was looking forward to. We got in there three hours early, set everything up, and then um, before, I, um, before I knew it, um, we were being told that we were done. And I looked at it, I had shot eight frames, and I had um, had all of 90 seconds with him. And so I was, this was frustrating. And so as I started to think about what is the next thing I want to do, what's my personal project next, I thought of the Bonsai Museum. And I had known about this collection for a long time. When I went to school here, I used to visit it. Um, I've had a few Bonsai of my own, which have all um, met their untimely denies, uh, demise at my, um, at my hands. <laughs> Um, and so I, I thought about that collection. I thought, well, let, let me go have a look. I'm not sure what's going what's gonna to happen, but let me go out there and, and see what I can find. And so um, this first image uh, from my book is of the Japanese white pine that we've, you know, we've all been talking about, uh, one of the most stunning trees in the, in the collection. And I encourage you, it's, it, you know, the, it, we're not that far from the Arboretum here. It really is, if you haven't been there, now is a really wonderful time to go in the spring when things are starting to bloom and blossom. And so I would, um, I would go to the Arboretum on days I wasn't working, uh, wander around for a little bit, and try to find a tree that, you know, on that day spoke to me. And, you know, what these trees gave me was, was time. You know, I could spend as much time as I want with them. I could appraise them fully, stand before them, no constraints, no one walking out. And, you know, the ones I seem like the opposite of the subjects I usually photograph. They stood before <laughs> me fully present, and, you know, their sense of time is measured in decades, even centuries, and, you know, not minutes, and I love that. So when I stand before these trees, you know, I see the trees, but what I really started to see after a while were the people behind them. Um, Anne and Sandy have alluded to this, but 
these trees are not self-sufficient once they become bonsai. You know, they need care every single day. And you think about, you think about a bonsai master who makes this tree like this, um, his or her life's work. They put everything into this tree, but um, knowing that at some point this tree is going to outlive them, it's going to be passed on to someone else, and this work of art that they have created is now going to be the hands of someone else. And I love that there's something very hopeful to me about that, you know, a belief in the future, a belief that there will, this tree will continue to exist past you. And also, I think there's this great sense of empathy, of letting go of your work and letting someone else um, take control of it. And that those are the things that, as you know, as you spend time with these trees, I think these things reveal themselves to you. And so these trees became sort of this window into all of that history, um, you know, a connection between events 100 years ago and you standing right in front of that tree. So what I was, what I was looking for was a way in for each tree, you know, a way to sort of understand the tree, to, 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 to photograph it in a way that felt meaningful. Um, early on, I, you know, as I had photograph, began photographing these trees and going back and back, um, I had a lot of doubts about this project. I had a lot of doubts about the value of these photos. Um, part of me was concerned that this was not so dissimilar to going to a museum and taking a photograph of a painting. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of like a fully formed piece of art. Like, what, what would I bring to it? And that was, you know, that was sort of the things I was churning over in my head as I, as I began this project and, um, you know, kept, kept photographing them. And what, what I realized, you know, it, it, it took a long time, but what I realized as I stood before these trees is that it was, it was not my job to, to document them per se. What, what really felt important to me was to capture something of the spirit of them, what it felt like to be near them. And this sort of little bit of a conversation you'd have with the tree when you spent enough time in front of it where it would reveal itself to you, you'd kind of start to see the sort of invisible hands of the bonsai masters who worked on it and all the little decisions they made that made the tree what it is today. And, it, you know, it's, it's remarkable to see when you go to the Arboretum, sometimes you can see people working on these trees and they make these, these cuts, these decisions, the way they wire the branches um, in anticipation of something that might not really happen for a year, five years, even 10 years. And I, I love that, that scale of time to be thinking about things in those terms instead of sort of the, you know, minute to minute that we often live our lives. And so I kept going back to the collection. Um, you know, as the seasons change, the leaves emerge. This was uh, this crepe myrtle. I think this photo was taken almost exactly two years ago. Um, and just to go back to one of my original points, now is a great time to visit. Um, the leaves are just starting to emerge on the trees, and it's a really beautiful time where you can still see the underlying, you know, structure of the tree, but you can also start to appreciate the color and the growth that they have at this time of year. So at this point, I had made about 100 trips to the Arboretum and had taken about 12,000 images. And at that point, you know, I realized that this personal project maybe was something more than just a personal project. Maybe something else could come of it. And I started, you know, I talked with colleagues, started editing these photos down and realized that, you know, maybe there was a book in this. And so I worked with the designer and made this book. And, you know, when I share this book, it's, it's a way of me sharing my gratitude for this place, sharing my impression of this place, and hopefully trying to pass on some of the gift it gave me to other people. And I think when you look at these you know, trees, they kind of, they speak their own language. You, you sort of, I don't know, the, the more time you spend with them, the, the more you understand um, where they're from. And so one of the, one of the really great pleasures, pleasures of this book, um, it's a book of about 85 photos or so, and I was also able to go into the archives of the Arboretum, of the Bonsai Museum, and look and see um, where these trees came from. And it's, it's remarkable, some of these beautiful, magnificent trees, what humble beginnings they had. Um, there's, a, you know, there's a blue atlas cedar that I think was found growing in a coffee can in the back of a nursery and was bought for $5. And another tree was found along the side of a highway and you know, someone, they pulled over, grabbed it, and you know, with the, I think one of the gifts of a bonsai master is to see potential. You know, see that <laughs> maybe this isn't a bonsai tree now, but maybe 10 years, 20 years down the road, this is going to be a magnificent tree. And so one thing I really wanted to include in this book in the, in the back, sort of this appendix, was a little bit about each tree that I photographed, about its past, its history, and um, where it came from. So I want to end on, the, on this image. Uh, this image was uh, I chose as the cover of the book. And um, 
I love this image. It sort of kind of distills to me like my favorite photos of these trees are somewhat abstract. They, the trees in some ways become something else more than just, you know, a tree, but they also, you can sort of appreciate um, the ancientness of these, pla these, of these living things. And one thing that was pointed out to me that I love that I didn't realize at the time is if you take the shape of this tree, the curve of it, and you overlay it on a map of Japan, it fits it almost perfectly. <laughs> and I thought that was just a wonderful bit of serendipity um, that I love about it. And so in closing, I just I want to share something that I had, I had written uh, as a foreword to this book. Um, and I wrote, if I'm able to share anything of my time around the bonsai, it is their grace in the passage of time, their peace, and the invitation they extend to include oneself in the natural order of things. Thank you. So, um, just sh shifting gears just a little bit, here we are back in 1972 when Richard Nixon went to China. And as you can see in the photo, there is a penjing in the background. As I mentioned earlier, the practice of penjing, also, could also be called bonsai, had been practiced in China for thousands of years, a thousand years anyway. And it was one of the art forms that moved to Japan along with things like calligraphy, the tea ceremony, Zen Buddhism. But it was continued to be practiced in China throughout all that time, but then in the more recent turbulent history in the China, Chinese world, um, most of the specimens were lost. So they're not examples of hundreds of years old penjing in China the way there are uh, bonsai in Japan. However, you can see that in 1972, when President Nixon went to China and is toasting Zhou Enlai, they had a penjing in the room and I think that it, uh, who knows where it came from. It was obviously important to them. I think it was used in the same way that we use flower arrangements to adorn special occasions. And we know that Richard Nixon was given three penjing when he left China. We don't know what happened to them. They're, they're no longer <coughs> existing. But the whole idea of using them as in, in, in diplomatic gifts was something the Chinese did as well as the, as well as the Japanese. Um, so the Chinese version of bonsai is a little different. It's a little looser, slightly less geometric, a little less, uh, maybe a one word would be refined. And the other thing is it's a little more directive. As you can see in this picture, it's a uh, pauper's tea tree, and there's a little figure. That's a philosopher scholar in the bottom. And so it's suggesting to you to put yourself in the spot of the philosopher scholar. Remember, the Japanese ones we've seen so far don't typically have a figure, so you can uh, use your imagination to interact with the tree as you would like. But this one's a little more directive, and I think it, it, it's a poem from the 8th century in China speaks to it. So uh, here it goes. It's from the Chinese poet Wang Wei. I sit alone in a bamboo grove, strumming on my lute while singing a song. In the deep forest, no one knows I am here. Only the bright moon comes to shine on me. Don't you think that fits with that, with that picture, that tree? Um, this one, uh, there is no figure, but again, you get that looser style. This was styled by Dr. Wu, who was the donor <coughs> who gave the, the original gift of Chinese Penjing that, that, is, that makes the museum bonsai and uh, Penjing. Um, he was a banker in Hong Kong. His, he had a fabulous collection. Several museums have examples of it, but we do here. To, and um, here's an interesting thing. This is an image from the Freer. And you can really see how the, ch the two arts relate to each other. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you could just picture that female figure easily transposed onto the, onto the tree. So it's, uh, while, while there are connections in Japanese art, it's much stronger in Chinese art to see, the, see this connection between the, pr the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional. This one's a huge tray. It was designed in 2004 by the then director of the Shanghai Botanical Garden. And again, you get those old, wizened, you know, gnarly looking trees, rocks, little figures. And here's an example. This happens to be on a, on a fan, but it's a, a scroll type painting. And you see the rocks, the trees, there's a little house. But it's the same notion. Um, Penjing doesn't have to have plant material. It can be rocks only. Can't you just see that dragon coming up from the earth? <laughs> But it also, you, you have a dragon form in plant material. Jack Sustick, the curator we've all been talking about, um, said this, you'd only find this in a museum. And I think what he means is, this is a lot of work. And at the museum, there are people doing bonsai all day, every day, seven days a week. And to maintain 
this figure requires that kind of constant, constant care and clipping. Uh, this was designed by Stanley Chin, a Chinese-American uh, who was uh, renowned for doing really extraordinary works of art, and this is a great example. This is perhaps the most famous uh, bonsai in the collection. It's actually from North America. It was designed by John Naka. It's called Goshen, which means protector of the spirit. These are Chinese junipers, and where you get the illusion of age is, in the wild, the trees are zapped by lightning, which kills the tops, and then the middle part of the foliage continues to survive. There are 11 uh, trees in this forest grove, and um, one for each of his grandchildren. The, the wider ones are in the front, and the narrower ones are in the rear, so it gives you the illusion of great depth. So it's, um, it, it's I, I've seen people who just stand there, you know, mesmerized by imagining themselves in the, in the middle of this grove. It's quite astonishing. Here's a picture of John Naka with it, which I'm showing both for scale and also please notice the foliage. The foliage in this case, the photo might have been taken at this time of year where there's new growth, so it's kind of, you know, a little bit scruffy. Or it could be that that's how the bonsai master in charge at the time preferred to see foliage. Whereas this picture, this bonsai master wants it to be more firm, if you will, more solid. There's nothing right or wrong about either of these. That's just, that's a choice, and that's part of what we've been talking about, how these trees live for hundreds of years, so they, they can, and they're living works of art, so they change. This is one of my personal favorites. It's a ponderosa pine designed by Dan Robinson, a Northwest, Pacific Northwest American bonsai artist. It was a gift from the U.S. Forest Service to the Arboretum in, on the occasion of the Forest Service 75th anniversary. Now, what's, there are two things about this tree. First of all, this is the view that the artist wants you to see, and every bonsai has a view that the artist wants you to see. It's like, you know, like uh, Stephen taking a photograph. That's, that's the, the view. Sometimes there can be more views, and in this case, um, the, the tree is, um, you know, roundish, squarish, biggish, and if from 360 degrees, there's something of interest. So they frequently put it on display in a place that you can walk around and see all those views. So if you have a chance to see it, do do, do that because it changes dramatically. The other thing I love about this is to me it expresses the, the Western, um, I don't know, uh, character. I could just see it's almost like a guy walking into a bar, you know. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I was just out at the Ar Arboretum. Uh, the tree was on view, and I was asking how it was doing. Oh, that tree's fine. It, it takes everything we throw at it. <laughs> <laughs> this one's a California juniper designed by Harry Harau, uh, who is another Japanese-American. He and John Naka both were the people who were uh, among those who were very um, strong in promoting bonsai as a study for people who are not Japanese and here in the United States. Harry Rao is no longer with us, unfortunately, but a lot of his work is at the um, Huntington in Pasadena. Uh, what's unusual about this tree is the bottom looks completely dead, doesn't it? I mean, you can't even believe that there's that foliage at the top. And the lifeline, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little brown line just on the edge, and that is where the water and nutrients go from the base to the foliage at the top. Now this tree, you can look at the silhouette and you can imagine that from the rear, it would also be interesting. You know, turned around would be interesting. But if you looked at it from the side, it would be about as interesting as a Fig Newton. That doesn't make it less beautiful than the one I just showed you. It's just, this is just a different approach. This tree is by Von Banting from Louisiana and it's a bald cypress. It started out life as a Christmas tree shape and over years he, he pruned it and encouraged it to grow so that it would look like an ancient bald cypress, like the one in the photo on the right with the, uh, no, le no limbs on the lower part, limbs reaching up to the light on the top, and then it has a knee. Now, what are those knees for? Well, if you think about it, trees breathe through their roots in addition to their leaves if they have them. And if you're a bald cypress, what are you gonna do if your feet are you know, up to your ankles in water? You lift up your knee and the air can come through, uh, through the roots that way. So that's, that's what the roots are about, and I think it's neat that he put one into the, the bonsai. Here's that zigzag trunk again. This is a bougainvillea, and it proves that any tree with a woody stem can be a bonsai. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out about this image is that this shows clearly that the, the bonsai master f has put this tree on formal display. And for formal display, it's like putting someone in their wedding clothes. You know, the tree's clipped to a ne'er-do-well, and you know, d there's no stray little you know, twigs or uh, dead, dead pieces or anything. 
the tip off for when you see a tree that's on a, a, a rocky slab like this one, or if it's on a raised tray, something like that, that's the, the clue that this is on formal display. If you see the trees just lined up on a counter or even even on a pedestal, but if they're not with the, this rock slab or tray, that that shows they're just you know they're just there to be seen. Um, often, also, they will make sure that the moss is especially beautiful for a tree that's on formal display. So when you see a tree like that, pay attention because that means the bonsai master feels that this tree is in tip-top shape. It's one of those minutes in its long, long life when it's you know worthy of your your close attention, and he hopes that he or she hopes that, that you will take a look. Um, so but thank you very much for coming today. We'd love to answer any questions, and we hope you've enjoyed this you know sort of round the world and it, from three different people <laughs> uh, in the world of bonsai here in Washington. Thank you. So. Any questions? Oh, surely someone has a question. <laughs> no? i just like to mention yes. that the uh, festival is coming up at the museum. And uh, I think Stephen was there last year. Do you know the dates this year, May? 14th, 15th? It's Saturday, May 14th or 15th. Yeah. But yes, yeah. it is coming right, right. up. And, right. and we'll, we'll all be there. Freedom is very close. <laughs> right. Yes. yes. Right. <laughs> we'll all be there. And lots of other people doing lots of other things too. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. That was absolutely fascinating. So thank you very much. Um, I was wondering Anne, if you could say something about the training process and particularly how the shapes are created. Um, yes, the, the question is how, how are the shapes created? And actually there are several different ways. Sometimes, the, um, mo most often uh, today they use wire, they, they trim and then they, they help the, the new growth by using wire to shape it in the way that they want it to go. Do you remember that wonderful tree that Stephen showed you where it looks like all the, the leaves, the limbs are going back that way? Well, actually how that started, uh, it was a Stanley Chin creation, and when um, Jack Sustick got it, he, it had it had that wonderful curving trunk. Remember that, but all the limbs were like this, so they're like a little triangle. And Jack thought, "How can I make this more interesting? I can make the limbs go this way." And he did it by wiring them so that they'd all go that way, um, and that's that. And you get that breathtaking effect. Um, the other thing to do is it's what's called clip and grow. That's more typically used by the Chinese, so that the, tr the trees are trimmed as opposed to wired. Um, and I, the way I think about uh, <coughs> pinching versus bonsai is um, it's it's like calligraphy. You know, if you have a block print, you can read the, the the sentence, but if you have it in copper plate, you can also read the sentence. So it's you know that they're they're not they're in the same bracket that way, just sort of different ways of treating it. And it's similarly with the training. You know, they use the, the wires in Japan and here in the States, but then clip and grow is more typical in China. Thank you. Great question. Anybody? Yes. Yes. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, my question, which is related to this, this uh -huh. one, uh, what kind of you know, analyzer or you know, uh, or new division do you usually use for training? That's a good question. He, the question is, what kind of mulch or uh, fertilizer is typically used? And the answer is, it depends on the tree. I've, I just asked that the other day when I was out there, because when you see them, that some of them have what looks like tea bags on their bases, other ones have pellets, other have, others have nothing. And so they, they use particular um, planting material for some trees uh, that, that is enough uh, nutrients for the tree. Others need different supplements. And so it's, it really depends on the type of tree and um, makes all the difference, actually, because when you think about it, if you just have this much space to get all your nutrients as opposed to acres, it's really essential that you get the right mix. So it varies from, from variety to variety. Great question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I could just add to that that um, it, it, it's very interesting. One of the um, bonsai masters that was responsible for um, uh, it, getting the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, um, their first um, bonsai tree um, in, the, in the 1950s, um, he has actually uh, uh, regularly 
talk to his trees. Like that was part of the care. And in, when you read about bonsai masters, that's one of the things that you, you find out that, that, you know, some of them, you know, it's, it's much more of a, um, they feel like they have, they really do have a relationship with the tree. And he, I think the quote that I saw in his obituary was, um, uh, he said, um, if you listen carefully to the tree, it will tell you what it needs. You know, so now I don't know, I'm sure that the tree would tell you, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, fertilizer exactly, but certainly <laughs> if it needs more light or if it needs more sun, you know, right. that might be something. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. Well, hearing that, I would like to ask Stephen, you feel that kind of conversation when you are trying to capture the picture mm. of the bonsai? Uh, yeah, I definitely felt like I had conversations with the trees. And uh, I think, you know, th this book and these photos are sort of in praise of like taking time, like spending a lot of time with one tree, standing before it and um, having that give and take. And, and, you know, I would often go to the Arboretum and be unsuccessful. You know, I'd photograph a tree and it just would not work out. And that would be a, a failed conversation. Um, so, <laughs> you know, my, my hope was with each tree to have that sort of point where I feel like I understood this tree in a way and I can make a photo to express that understanding. Yes. Thank you. It's interesting stories. And Thank I have you. a question. The, all the ones that you showed us in the screen by the uh, care by the professional ones I artists for how you call career. Yeah. Are there people doing this as a hobby? And it sounds like it's a really, really huge, serious commitment every day. And given the, the current society or time that you're always busy, mm. and you don't really feel like you can spend every day for a long time to care of, to take care of this long side. If I want to do it as a hobby, is it possible? Is there <laughs> any way to do it? Well, I think, I think the question is, well, thank you. Yes, um, it, it is a commitment on the part of the uh, curators. Yes, there are lots of hobbyists who who do practice um, who do practice it. There's the Potomac Bonsai Association, and um, and yes, most of the people are older because they're the people who have time. Um, but then, but then there are younger people who um, get into it because it's um, it's a extremely rewarding. You know, uh, you, you're creating a living work of art. And it's got the the challenge, the the beauty of nature. Um, you know, it's a, a wonderful way to be uh, expressing your creativity, and those people tend to have uh, assistance or someone, you know, friends who can, you know, like a group of people who will do it. But you're right. I think, uh, especially in Japan, I believe that it's it's not as popular as it used to be because people are busy and, you know, there's a space issue because you you know they need to be outside. They can't just. It's not like. Um, you know, a house plant that can be just stuck in a window. Um, and, you know, some of them, a tropical bonsai could live in a window, but most of them prefer to be outside. Cause yeah, but at, the, uh, at World Bonsai Day, which you were mentioning earlier, um, which is coming up in May at the Arboretum, there are people there selling bonsai and many um, hobbyists there, um, I think, who are, um, <laughs> you know, excited to, you can hear people, you know, sort of trading stories about, you know, their experience, um, you know, learning to raise bonsai. And, um, I th and, and I think a number of the nurseries in the area um, have someone on staff who is more, you know, ex experienced, who can sort of give you some guidance. I know I have a bonsai tree, and there's a, a Korean um, bonsai master, Duki Hong, who was with uh, Benki's nursery, you know, for a while. And so, you know, I would ask him for advice if I was worried of, you know, am I doing the right thing? <laughs> um, but um, they, uh, you know, at, at the, the, the World Bonsai Day, that's, that's, that's a good time to come because you can learn about it if you were interested in it as a hobby. Mm -hmm. you know. May I respond to that? Yes, of course. Um, I'm a member of two of the local clubs. Oh, oh, great. Uh -huh. yeah. Most of them uh, members are retired. However, there are some young people who are joining. For, for instance, the Northern Virginia Bonsai Society has 50 members and is growing. <laughs> the other club at Brookside, and they both have websites. Um, the Brookside Club has is a smaller group, 
But we each gather at each meeting, and usually once a month, and sometimes twice a month. Um, and uh, we help one another. The more experienced and one of the former curators at the Banzai Museum, Jim Hughes, is a member uh, of uh, Brookside yeah. Club, uh, and so his expertise is always available. And there are two fantastic experts on the Northern Virginia Club who are constantly helping uh, the junior members. And uh, we bring our trees, we work on them, we wire them, we repot. Uh, we prune, and we have other experts come in who speak and perhaps demonstrate at the same time. So we're constantly learning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It looks like it's, a, it's almost like a therapeutic process. I think so. I think so. I, th I mean, it's all encompassing, really. It, it takes you out into nature, even at your own home, when you're working on it. That's that's a, I, I, I'm going to repeat that for the video. It takes you out out into nature you, even when you're at your own home. Yeah. So yes. even if you have a little patio. Even if you have a little <laughs> patio. Right. Thank you. And yes, in the back. Well, I noticed how big some of them were. Yes. And I, my, you mentioned repotting, and that was my question. How often do you have to repot them? Well, um, can you keep them small? You know, well, they, they, repotting doesn't mean it's not like a house plant that you repot into something larger. It goes back into this, either the same pot or if, it, if the curator or bonsai master wants to change the pot, it's not going to be to a bigger one. So what happens is that the tree gets removed, and if it, honestly, for that for that big imperial pond, that requires you know slings of and a big you know um, contraption to lift it up and take the pot away. Then they scrape away the uh, excess earth, they cut away a lot of those feeder roots so that new ones will grow and uh, replace it with, with fresh potting material that's specific to that tree. Um, and uh, uh, really, uh, the, you know, it's reduced, I think, um, almost by a third. Um, it depends on the tree, but it, it's, it's very, uh, it's very important. It's important to do it right, and it's important to do it when you're supposed to, which varies from tree to tree. I think the the imperial pine, it's every you know five years or something like that. Some of the smaller trees, it might be more often. It depends on the variety and how quickly their roots grow. But if you're if you're living, I'm talking as if I'm a tree. If you're living just you know on those feeder roots, you need lots of fresh ones. So that's you know that that's why it has to be repotted, fairly often, you know more often than you probably have to do a, a house plant typically. I would think. Yeah. Well, these have been great questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mari. And well, thank you. Okay. I want to wrap up quickly. Um, we have great resources. We don't have uh, any technical materials resources at the library, but I have experience to receive a couple of the um, bonsai questions, especially for the related to Goshin. That researcher continued to contact me like for two years to ask about that question. <laughs> so I did some research, but you know, we also have a print and photographs division collection, some other collection in the library. So if you keep interested in, you know, please come back and do some research and please join me in approaching the three speakers, Bonsai Torio. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.